I think, you know, I think we're at the stage where we're realizing yeah. as, as humanity that we have such a huge footprint on the planet that we are now responsible for managing the planet. And mm-hmm. it's not like we're, um, we're the victims of the planet's processes. We are really controlling a lot of their processes mm-hmm. so of, of the planet. So, so that's like the entry into why we need all of this. And then once, once you realize that, wow, we really are managing the planet's future, then you need technology to help you do that. And whether mm-hmm. it's a coral reef or a tropical forest or an agricultural field, knowing what you've got, understanding its condition is just foundational to Absolutely. making a decision. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be the answer to all of, the, uh, of it all, but you won't make the right decision if, unless you know what you've got. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Rajneesh. And I'm Bridget. Welcome to Terra Science. The podcast where reality matters. Well, Bridget, today we have an amazing guest. Uh, this is Greg Asner, and Greg is the director of ASU's Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science, uh, which he started in 2019. And I've known Greg uh, for about 10 years. Uh, we were both together at Carnegie Institution for Science at Stanford University. And I've been working with Greg on a project which we will talk about. But before we get into that, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to Greg. Uh, Basically, Greg has been known to be to map forests using airplanes and satellites. But he's not only done that, he's, he's developed new technologies to gather data, large-scale data, uh, like biodiversity, uh, carbon emissions, uh, coral reefs. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, you know, these kinds of things that we think about and see, well, how do people study global at global level? What, what, what happens? That's what Greg has done. And I think it's just truly remarkable. So Greg, would would you like to uh, say a few things about yourself? Uh, Well, thanks for having me. This is fun. Uh, Yeah, I have been mapping the planet for quite a long time now and forests and coral reefs and you name it. We've we've had lots of opportunities to contribute. And I I think um, satellite mapping and the aircraft mapping we'll talk about are are contributions to a larger problem of trying to understand exactly what's going on on our planet and how we can manage it better into the future. One of the projects that we've been working together on for about four to five years, um, uh, Greg developed uh, what we call Class Light, uh, and it stands for uh, Carnegie Landsat uh, An- Analysis System, and that's the bigger version. But then uh, the that was Class, and the Class Light is the lighter version, uh, so that anyone can use it. And not only that, he developed this this uh, software, which utilizes satellite images uh, to map. Uh, and to uh, monitor forests at large scale, but it, he made it very easy for anyone to use with a course. So Greg, if you can tell us what makes ClassLight unique uh, from all the other, because there are other uh, methods, including infrared, and uh, you know, uh, what, what, what makes it unique and how it can be applied both forests and agricultural applications. Yeah, um, like you said, Class Light is kind of a light version of the old class system, which is um, really it was its its birth its its earliest days are 1997, 1998, and you know you have to understand how to understand how it works. You have to kind of go back in time and say, okay, we we had these satellite images coming to us in the late 90s, and you could look at them and see that there's a forest in front of you on the image, but analyzing it to get percentages of how much forest cover is present, how much has been lost, those kinds of things, it was always a challenge. So way back then we started developing methods using satellite imagery. And by 2005, it was called CLASS, the Carnegie Landsat Analysis System. And it ran on a supercomputer. We mapped the Brazilian Amazon, for example. We had a lot of discoveries that occurred about humanity's interactions with forests in general. Gold mines, was that it? <laughs> right? That came later. Actually, early <laughs> on, it was logging, selective logging. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so, um, the, and I guess the breakthrough in, the, in that method was that, um, you know, when you look down on a forest from an airplane or, or in a satellite image and you see a big clear cut, that's kind of easy to see. And, and that, that was understood pretty well. What class and now class light can do is see the really fine scale, almost to the naked eye, almost invisible changes that occur in forests from other types of human activities, such as selective logging, taking out certain, you know, mahogany trees, taking out 
bits and pieces of the forest in a way that it's a little tough to see with the naked eye, but the software allows you to bring it to life and to see it. Wow. When we did it, when we did it in 2005, we basically doubled the amount of forest loss that was occurring in Brazil just wow. by seeing all the all this fine scale stuff that was being missed. And that's the essence of that software package. And and today, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's evolved even more. Class Light, you're right, uh, about 2000 and I can't remember, but something like 2010 uh, decided that we needed to move it away from supercomputers and experts and provide it to managers, conservationists, uh, policy development offices, um, other scientists, academics. So a broader, we wanted to generate a broader user community. And so Classlight was invented and we went through a lot of work to try to, you know, whittle this thing down to something that you can just run on your laptop. And it does today and you can, it's quite okay. easy to do that. And um, now because of that, the, the, um, the applications of Classlight really exploded. They went from these forests that I was interested in to, and those were tropical forests, to other kinds of forests of all, you know, of all kinds around the planet. Um, other types of ecosystems, including agriculture. And, and so Classlight now has a broader base that applies to many different types of settings. Yes, and, and uh, we have been uh, applying it uh, uh, in agriculture with really uh, very um, successful results in monitoring what happens after, uh, for, for example, an orchard is treated with, with, with an amendment. And so we can see how, how actually the green cover changes in response to something like that. It's, it's, it's truly amazing at large scale. Yeah, I think it gives us a sense for not only our role in changes on the Earth's surface, but also kind of the natural, uh, uh, almost said algorithms, the natural rhythms of the planet's biology is kind of also expressed in class in the class light output. So it's a, it's a fun tool. Once you learn it, you can really cruise around the planet and, and explore places ecologically. And so uh, I think I think that's been part of the academic use of it over the years as well. Right. And now we've expanded it. So now we can also offer it as a service. So if somebody just wants to know what's going on uh, in their orchard, uh, we can run the class light for them as well. Yeah. And for the course, how how long does it take for you to, to learn how to use it? Is it a simple course to take or uh, can anybody really do it as well? I think you have to have a basic computer skills and mm -hmm. you have to be, I would say, seriously interested in spatial information gotcha. and then you can learn it. And it's not, it's not weeks of learning, it's days. days oh. Well, from class light, uh, how about we switch a little bit towards water? Uh, I remember there was a Discovery Channel, I think it was, right? The, the, and um, um, you, were, you were part of it, of that uh, uh, episode. It yeah. was called XTO. <laughs> Yeah. What do you want to know? Um, you know, water, <laughs> the planet is mostly covered in water. So, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. we're sitting here working on this severely difficult problem of land issues. But, um, you know, I actually started out in water when I was really young in the science world, 1992 or three, uh, worked in water settings. And then I got busy on land. And, and then, you know, some years ago, I went back to the water and um, mm -hmm. have been working on different techniques, different approaches using aircraft and satellites to do three things about water. One is the uh, water quality, what's in the water itself. Yeah. A second one is what's, on, what's below the water, like coral mm -hmm. reefs. And the third one is what is uh, the amount of water in certain land units like mm -hmm. lakes and rivers and stuff that, that, that humans depend on. And that one is a newer one, but I've been working on that mm -hmm. as well. So um, water, yeah, water, water everywhere. And so we're, we've expanded and I'm happy to tell you about any of those. Well, so yeah. one thing that comes to mind is, you know, it's, it's everywhere, but uh, we always hear about droughts. And so perhaps it's not where, where we want it to be in the amounts that we want it to be. So uh, that, and th that people think has to do with human activity again. And so I was wondering how, what you think of that? Yeah, um, that's true. The, the, the partitioning of water on the planet, whether it's in the atmosphere, in rivers, lakes, and, and ocean basins, et cetera, or in locked up in ice. All three of those are changing really rapidly on the planet. And I think humans are, they are we, we know we've driven this through our greenhouse gas emissions and some se severe um, disruptions in our climate system. 
but now we're kind of the, reci re the recipients of this redistribution of water. And so mm -hmm. what are the technologies that let us understand what's happening and also to forecast what will happen next? And um, drought is one that's really important. We started working on drought in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, it got mainstream for us, kind of science, academ academic mainstream by about 2015. And um, it's still not totally out there like class light is. Mm -hmm. It's not like right. everybody can look at water change, but the drought issue is, is significant. And um, whether you're working, whether you're managing croplands or a forest, uh, the newest technology that we have on board our aircraft, and I can tell you about what we're launching into orbit, um, oh. but the newest technology on board our aircraft lets us really quantify how much water is in the vegetation. Oh, wow. That's, that's quite impressive. So like moisture. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's, that's amazing. And is that uh, appli just applicable to, you know, forestry as well? But are you using that also for agricultural purposes? Yeah, we are. So wow. I just came back from a mission three or four days ago where we're doing that in Florida. Okay. Um, I, what's the condition of croplands in Florida at this mm -hmm. time of year in these, you know, X, Y, and Z uh, crop species um, mm -hmm. based on, you know, A, B, and C management, trying to figure out the matrix of human and natural and, you know, in, uh, and climatological conditions that are generating high productive high productivity yields and crops uh, low and drought is one that mm -hmm. farmers are not uh, there there's there's their challenges uh, mm -hmm. big time and so um, the new newest technology allows us to literally quantify the amount of water in the foliage and in the plant for some plants the entire above ground part portion of the plant. And that's yeah. really that's really giving us a view into into these plants as to you know are they are they start, starting to teeter are they mm -hmm. is the if it's agriculture it would mean a management intervention like water the plants but even that yeah. is not as easy anymore as it used to be not only because right. of water availability but the management of water among farmers is a highly contentious issue um, yes. diversions you know it's it's not just water your plants it's a much more complicated mm -hmm. landscape than that. Right, and, and and also directly links to crop health, uh, as well. So, so you were talking about you're going to tell us something about the satellite as well. Uh, is that a different thing than this? Yeah, well, it's no secret anymore. But um, I'm serving as the chief science officer for a new pair of satellites that we're launching in September of 2023. Wow. Okay. Uh, literally, the satellites are copies of the technology that's in the back of my aircraft and the quality and mm -hmm. instrumentation, the, 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 the composition and quality of the instru instrumentation in my aircraft really is unique. And we, we haven't been able to make more airplanes and more of these instruments on aircraft. Mm -hmm. It's just very difficult to create. So we said, well, let's go to orbit. Let's put one up or two up in this case for wow. everyone to use Great. rather than me running wow. around in an airplane. And yeah. And we'll, we'll have the plane because the plane's needed. But, um, but uh, it's, the mission is called Carbon Mapper. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and you might say, okay, that's about carbon. Actually, the technology also serves a wide variety of issues. It's just that a primary mission for the mission is carbon. However, it sees the water content in the plants. It sees nutrients ah. in the plants. It sees coral reefs below the ocean. It sees the quality oh, of the water. Yeah. And so... Carbon Mapper is kind of a misnomer. It's got a, a wide range of application. So it just That's literally maps uh, the uh, living or organic uh, surface of the mm -hmm. of the globe. So you so that's the carbon mapper maybe linked to it. That's correct. So the technology is called imaging spectroscopy. It sounds awfully technical, I know, but it it is a unique capability that has not been operationalized in Earth orbit prior to now. We're going to make it operational in um, September 2023. And the, the imaging spectroscopy is a type of remote sensing that sees the molecular composition of something. You, you point the instrument at plants and you see not all of the molecules in the plant, but some really important ones. Mm -hmm. For example, the water quant content, H2O, mm -hmm. that's a molecule. Mm -hmm. And so it actually sees the H2O molecules through a, a, a mechanism that has to do with the spectroscopy and spectroscopy is a, is a technical term for how molecules interact with sunlight. Mm -hmm. And so the entire technology is based on the fact that sun is shining down on plants, say, if that's your interest, 
And the molecules in those plants are actually reacting to the sunlight. And this instrument sees that reaction. And, wow. that, and we're able to quantify how much water, uh, molecules that have nitrogen in them, like protein and chlorophyll, uh, any, any of these molecules that interact with sunlight, that, that undertake um, an interaction with sunlight, I'm trying not to be too technical, uh, you know, <laughs> the instrumentation can see that interaction. In well, no, that, that that's great. So I mean, yeah. even, even nutritional values. So if you go to anthocyanins or other pigments or antioxidants, uh, I think uh, that that's possible as well then. Yeah, uh, I think, right. If the, if the instrumentation, if the spectrometer is high enough quality, right. and in the past, we've, I was on a mission, satellite NASA mission in 1999, where we put one of these up in orbit, but it, was, it wasn't a really high quality instrument. It was kind of a first try instrument uh-huh. and it didn't have the signal. It wasn't it didn't provide the, the, the mm-hmm. details well enough. So we couldn't get to those antioxidants, but with the right kind of instrument in orbit, there's a lot more possibility. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think this, this instrument will map nitrogen, for example, quite readily. For wow. Yeah. So another thing you used to, um, um, I, I've seen a, a TED talk as well on this, and anyone can look it up. Uh, there was uh, getting uh, species level information, uh, like in a forest, what are the different species of trees and almost like a three-dimensional image of even the height of the trees. So sounds like that is also incorporated in this. It is the same technology that's been in my plane. And, and so it's a really cool thing because you, remote sensing is no longer uh, just looking down and making maps. It's understanding the biology, the evolution, the origins of different plant properties. And so mm-hmm. The biodiversity story is one that uh, I think I'm most well known for. And what I what I what I asked is, um, are if you fly over a forest mm-hmm. canopy and you map its molecular composition, the way I just said, right? Do those mole- are those molecular compositions of tree A versus tree B versus tree C are they all similar or are they different? With species. By, by species mm-hmm. or what we say taxonomically, right? And so, and it turned out in the Brazilian Amazon, or not the Brazilian Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazon, that 80% of the time, the different molecular compositions that we're mapping from the air were different species. Wow. Yeah. wow. Like signatures, like you sign your yeah. name, we know it's you. Um, yeah. Species wow. do that molecularly or chemically. And so I, I got real, I got real um, excited and a lot of my work. That's why I left the ocean for so long. I was really focused on that thing. Uh, wow, we can map biodiversity and, you know, had a yeah. you know, really major scientific breakthroughs that are, I think, um, help pave the... the- and did, didn't this, if, if I remember, didn't this work lead to a significant uh, investment in Peru? Uh, uh, I think there was, right, there was something like that? Yeah. In that case, uh, Peru invested a huge amount for, so so we mapped all of the Peruvian and Amazon and Andes, the, the mountain mm-hmm. chain that's right next to the Amazon and then the Amazon area, huge area, massive area, it took us a few years. And uh, in that mapping, we discovered entirely new communities of trees that mm-hmm. were not unknown to locals, but unknown to the government's management programs and so you know there's a big difference there and so back in lima they said wow we have uh this whole area that isn't in our protected area network so they created a new national park that included in uh data from our uh this this biodiversity mapping and then we were taken to borneo same thing Uh the malaysian government took us over there to do a new four hundred thousand hectare it's about a million acre uh reserve or forest uh, 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 national park type of activity, you know, and so we've been all around the planet doing this biodiversity wow. mapping yeah. for that purpose. Right. Yeah. No, I, I remember, I think one time I called you and you were on some remote island and I said, what are you doing there? <laughs> global ecology. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it's, amazing. you know, global ecology is global. Right. <laughs> and the and the corals are the same story right we fi- you know we figured out we can't do it as easily because what seawater is um so absorptive mm-hmm. that it's real it's like really hard to see through seawater but we're getting to the point now where we can map different groups of coral species right and so, so do you do so- most of your coral mapping in hawaii 
I know that's where you live, right? Or where where do you usually I'm go? From Hawaii, and I do a lot. We we've created the system here, uh, mm-hmm. and, but um, I have mapped now in Southeast Asia, Asian reefs, wow. um, Caribbean, all over the Caribbean, from Belize to Dominican Republic, Virgin Islands. I just got back from Florida. I did the Florida Keys. You know, wow. I'm going around doing this. Again, it's for specific management related questions in those places today, Mm -hmm. but literally the same instrumentation I'm putting up with the team into orbit in the fall. And all of this is being gathered into the Allen Coral Atlas, which is publicly available, right? Is that correct? Right. So you can go to, so the Allen Coral Atlas is a project that I direct that is the world's largest coral reef monitoring system. And Mm -hmm. it's a cousin to all this. It's confusing for people to hear about all these programs and projects that we run, but, (laughs) but, um, but that is where all of the coral reef monitoring ends up ultimately. Okay. Yeah. Um, right now, right now we, the, if you go on there, it is free. It's Mm -hmm. allencoralatlas.org. If you go on there, you can for free, download data, look at reefs. You can see where coral reefs are. The big breakthrough that'll happen in 2023 will be uh, how much coral cover is there? Is it, is it living or is it a dead reef? And unfortunately we have a huge range of of answers to that. So, so on that side too, what are, what are some of those like interventions that you want to highlight, especially for not just coral, but also carbon mapping and um, the biodiversity as well? Question. I think, you know, I think we're at the stage where we're realizing as, as humanity that we have such a huge footprint on the planet that we are now responsible for managing the planet. And Mm -hmm. it's not like we're, um, we're the victims of the planet's processes. We are really controlling a lot of their processes. Mm -hmm. So of, of the planet. So, so that's like the entry into why we need all of this. And then once, once you realize that, wow, we really are managing the planet's future then you need technology to help you do that. And whether mm-hmm. it's a coral reef or a tropical forest or an agricultural field, knowing what you've got, understanding its condition is just foundational to Absolutely. making a decision. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be the answer to all of, the de- uh, of it all, but you won't make the right decision if, unless you know what you've got. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So That's so true. We're trying to work at the foundation level. Yeah. And but but then then that uh, that information that data has to be managed or interpreted in 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 the right way as well, and then legislation or whatever uh, you know uh, action needs to be taken has to be also directed with with the focus of making a, a positive change. Uh, yeah. Locally as well as globally, that's that's the harder part. Uh, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure you must have heard uh, um, uh, Sadhguru, who's the founder of Isha Foundation. He's doing this motorcycle ride from London to India, 100 days. And uh, I think his, his main objective has been to um, uh, promote awareness of uh, soil health and have people talk about soil health so they can make an impact in uh, future legislation. And so, so what do you think, what, what kind of things can people actually, uh, because there is a lot of information. And what I like about information is that anyone can... Uh, get as much of it as they want. They can get really deep or they can get some uh, higher level. But then where they get the higher level and correct information is always shifting. And I think you've already contributed a lot in a way to to bring awareness and through social media. And I know your lab is very active uh, on there as well. But how can how, what, what can we look towards the future in educating people more about what they can do and what is it that they can do? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I'm finding at my stage and age in my career that that's the question I ask every day. And mm-hmm. it's awareness is important, and there are, we need more of that, and people need to be doing that. But I think that this high-resolution monitoring that I represent, it provides specificity to what people can do. Rather than saying, uh, save the coral reef, it's like, okay, how do you do that? Like, I, I haven't heard someone say, no, don't save the coral reef. You know, most people are, agree that that's something worth having on the planet. They yes, want yeah. specificity. And so um, one, a good example, just one example, is that, you know, in our work, we're finding that what people do on land, up to hundreds of kilometers inland of a reef, of, of the shoreline, 
really affects the health of these corals and wow. these and these uh, habitats. It's not sort of an esoteric, cartoonish sort of understanding. It's real detailed. Mm -hmm. And so it's gotten to the point now where we can track a chemical pollutant source, like from households, into reef systems and say, you know, guys, we're tracking this. It's killing these corals. Please reduce the use of X, Y, or Z product. It's getting to that so that people have real mm -hmm. specific interventions they can participate in. That's the mm -hmm. future of Earth of, of observing. It's high resolution, but it's also high. It's high resolution, like the pixels are, are, are very detailed, but it's high resolution in the sense of the information that it provides. You know? Good, yeah. It can be down to different chemical products. And, and that's really what's needed. Uh, you know, I think uh, but making people aware of the problem, but then also uh, specifically the solutions. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, that's and and really it can't be impossible solutions. They can't be these bars that no one's going to achieve, you or me right. or anyone else. It's got to be stuff mm -hmm. that you can do. And, right. and, yeah. and then that also tells you what you don't have to do. Like, we don't have to worry about some, you know, something X. Mm -hmm. but, we, but this thing Y, we're seeing it is getting into the reef system from 50 to 100 kilometers inland. Please, let's get that off the, off the market. Right. And then it becomes like, I've had this happening. That then it becomes like a thing between science, management, taking care of the planet, in certain aspects of um, the commercial world, you know, and certain companies mm -hmm. hear that their product is killing reef, there's pushback, then you have to have evidence. Again, yeah. the remote sensing is evidence and it's admissible in court. I mean, it, I have had to yeah. do that over and over again. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and what I like about that is that it, it can also have regional impacts because mm -hmm. there are different issues regionally. And so this specificity can really provide better answers. So not everyone doesn't have to do the recycling the same way. <laughs> exactly. I, we can't, we do, and, and the other thing is, is that um, big business, we all depend on it. It's, you know, it's part of our, of our world. Um, but, you know, people can have a bigger effect on how businesses take care of the planet by knowing the specificity of our mm -hmm. footprint. Right. You know, it's kind of like um, here in Hawaii, uh, detailed data came out that certain sunscreens were killing corals. Right. And the state of Hawaii was the first state in the U.S. to ban certain sunscreens. It didn't say no sunscreen in Hawaii, you're all going to get skin cancer. It said, no, <laughs> these and their specific yeah. chemicals that were found to be killing reef. And now yeah. they're banned from Hawaii. And there was pushback from industry. But in the end, industry is going to want coral reefs to be alive, too, because that's why people are coming here and buying their sunscreen. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's all part of the same supply chain and circular economy that we have to yeah. push towards. But all, yeah. all I can say is that we need a lot more of that. <laughs> we need a lot more of that. Yes. Yeah. Fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's super exciting. Um, I, I have one, one question for you, Greg, I want to know what, what drives you? Like, what do you get up in the morning to feel so, you know, driven? Cause you've done so many important things in lots of different realms. I, it's, I've been lucky to see a lot of the world. Yeah. Um, 137 countries. There was like this lab thing that they had for me some years ago. 137 countries. I was like, wow. I did? And so, um, wow. but I've been very, who gets to do that? And so I yeah. and so the two things that motivate me are environmental, the beauty of our environment and the uniqueness of our planet, of course, mm -hmm. but also the people I've met and the fact mm -hmm. that people do want to play a stewardship role. They yeah. do. I, I haven't heard someone say, no, I want to pollute the planet. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like the tragedy of the commons takes over. And so I see a lot of potential to change the course with the kind of information that we're generating. It's not the only, it's just part of the foundation of the answer. Mm -hmm. So that motivates me. Yeah. I'm, we're going yeah. strong. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And that's kind of also, you know, what we want to try to do with Terra Science is just get more of it out there, share your knowledge and, you know, hopefully interest more people in learning the specifics and what they can do and all of that. So really appreciate it. No, yeah. thank you. You guys are critical. The communication, I mean, I, you know, where would we be without folks like you? So, so yes, it's going to take this village to get not just the awareness, mm -hmm. but the, um, the interaction with the right kind of solutions right. and outcomes and people actually playing their role. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, this was this was really amazing. Uh, we covered a lot of ground very quickly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, yeah. really a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thanks again for watching. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and also the video format will be on YouTube as well. And I do want to shout out Riverside.fm. That is the podcast recording studio that we are using. And it is a really great format because you can separate, separate out the audio and video files for each member, uh, whoever, wherever they're, they're Zooming from or joining the, the meeting from. So it really helps with increasing the quality of each clip. Uh, so there's going to be a link in the bio as well for you guys to check out uh, riverside.fm if you're interested and you know have any purpose of using it yourself. And lastly, thank you again to Greg for, for joining us for today's podcast. We will definitely link down below some of the work to, to his project. So thanks again. Hope you guys have a fantastic day and don't forget to like and subscribe.